40, like almost 40 million people. So not one black person can, um, you know, speak for a race that got, we got Lil Wayne and Barack Obama. We're gonna speak for that. <laughs> the more we're able to show people how special we are and how special our stories are, the more they relate to us and they don't see us as an other, the more we become a, an us, you know, and, and, not, and not an us versus them. What fan favorites were nominated for the 50th NAACP Image Awards? Blackish, Black Panther, This Is Us, and How to Get Away with Murder. You have to tune in for the live presentation March 30th for more. Neighborhood councils are a venue where your voice can be heard. The recent Rally in the Valley workshop provided information on how to run and become a candidate in future elections. We're here with all 34 neighborhood councils in the Valley trying to reach out to the stakeholders in the Valley, people who live, work, own property, or otherwise involved with the community, to get them interested in becoming involved in neighborhood councils. Neighborhood councils are the grassroots government authority in our community, in the city of Los Angeles specifically. So a lot of people don't know that neighborhood councils exist. That's why we're trying to go out to the communities to try to promote neighborhood councils as much as possible. Your voice matters. But in order to make your voice matter, you have to participate. This is a voluntary position, of course, but voices do go forth to city council, and they do matter, and we do make a difference. We're here at the Neighborhood Council Workshop. We're both running for positions in the city of Van Nuys. And we just want to get more information on how to start building our campaign and also getting information on how we can make our city better and what our specific roles that we can do to make our community a lot better. Even within our communities, it doesn't have to be running for Congress. Be the change that you want to see. Want to take a trip under the sea without getting wet? Well, here's your chance to experience other worlds in virtual reality. Rasha Goel takes us to Dreamscape Immersive. We've all heard the words virtual reality, but how many of us have actually had the chance to experience it? Well, now you can. I'm at the Westfield Mall in Century City, and I'm about to immerse into a whole new reality. Come with me as I explore Dreamscape. Dreamscape's founders say they draw from their backgrounds in filmmaking and theme park attractions to offer virtual reality experiences that marry the best of both forms of entertainment. We were able to talk to one of the founders, former chief creative officer of Disney Imagineering, Bruce Vaughn. As part of Dreamscape, we wanted to do something different than what most VR is. We wanted to have a shared experience that was very important to us. So this year, we're six people at a time, step into a, in a, an experience that feels somewhere between the cross-section of stepping into a movie. So we, I like to say the tropes of cinema, the things that we're familiar with with cinema, and a theme park attraction. So guys, we are now officially boarding, so I'm going to go inside to go get my gear on. Follow me. All right, well, I'm all geared up. I'm going to put my headset on. I'll catch you later. Welcome, team. I'll be leading you on an important mission. Below us, there's a pot of whales that needs our help. There's just one problem. We don't know what else is down there. And these are nothing like I've experienced before. Not only are you in complete different worlds, but you can actually touch and feel things and create your own avatar. Unbelievable, that is the word I have for you. Now this experience takes you beyond virtual reality. In fact, you're the star of your own movie. So if you're looking to try something new or really just emerge yourself into a different world, Dreamscape is a place you need to be. I promise you, you'll be entering a whole new reality. Dreamscape Immersive is located at the Westfield Century City Mall. For more details, visit dreamscapeimmersive.com. One side of the family specializes in traditional fine arts, the other in Disney animation. Work spanning four generations of this unusual mix are raising money for a good cause. Gil Reyes has more from Eagle Rock. There's a fundraiser happening at Center for the Arts Eagle Rock spotlighting the contributions of one of the neighborhood's most enduring artist families. Part of the proceeds benefit the center. That's how I roll. It's, I see something that needs doing or helping, and I say, okay, I'll, I'll join, you know, do what I can. 
Activist and fine arts mask maker Linda Johnstone Allen headlines the exhibit entitled Industrious Folk, a family showcase spanning four generations. On sale, creations from the family archives. Linda's husband Terry is the son of the late Disney animator Mary Ellison Allen. His side of the family helped bring Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs to life. She loved it. She had a wonderful time. The gals, it was a good job back then for women. They got paid really pretty well back then, comparatively speaking. The Allen's daughters are artists too. Miss Mindy operates a co-brand with Disney to sell figures like these all over the world. Candace Jeanette Metzger is a graphic designer for Hasbro Toys. Both daughters never forgot their Northeast LA roots and teach classes at the center. We just want to help our community and bring arts to everybody. People who can afford it, people who cannot afford it. We really want everybody to have access. My mom really set an example early on about um, how important it is to participate. And, um, you know, I, I feel like it just makes it, the experiences better for everyone. The folks at Center for the Arts Eagle Rock say fundraisers like these are crucial in keeping some of its important programs going. They include free after school programs, concerts, and exhibitions. We provide free arts programming to children in Title I schools. And so, with the community being invested in our work, it gives us the opportunity to serve more children. And the next Linda Johnstone Allen, the next Miss Mindy, the next CJ Mesker. Drawing inspiration for the next generation of Northeast LA artists. For more info on Center for the Arts Eagle Rock, its programs and donations, log on to cfaer.org. Over in Hollywood, another kind of art took center stage. Felix LA is described as contemporary, experimental, and organic, and it was all on display in bungalows and private suites at the iconic Roosevelt Hotel. <music> Felix LA is the inaugural edition of an art fair, and it's a throwback to the hotel fairs that were done in the 90s. So we have 38 exhibitors, and we've taken over the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. Uh, the poolside cabanas are all exhibitor booths, and the 11th floor tower uh, which is filled with about 20 rooms of galleries presenting the artworks. We have a broad range of galleries that are, that are here exhibiting during uh, this LA Art Week that's happening at the moment. So today we open the show and we're expecting a good crowd to come through. People brought a lot of good quality to this fair and we're really excited about it. Think you know Griffith Park? Well, think again. Beyond the picturesque hiking trails and the iconic movie scenes are decades of hidden histories. As Gil Reyes reports, the Archer Museum attempts to uncover them in a new exhibit. Now, even longtime visitors to Griffith Park who visited this urban oasis dozens of times will no doubt pick up a few new tidbits of information just by visiting this fascinating new exhibit, Investigating Griffith Park. But you know what? The exhibit is not quite finished yet. That's where you come in. We are embarking on a multi-year, multi-phase project in which we will create an exhibition with the help of our neighbors, the citizens of Los Angeles, tourists from around the world. The Autry Museum's Sarah Wilson wants to know, which Griffith Park histories and mysteries do you want uncovered? The museum is now accepting your written ideas for its new but unfinished exhibit, Investigating Griffith Park. Here are some early suggestions. There is a lot of fascination with the old zoo. Uh, a lot of people walk by it, they hike to it, um, but the story of the old zoo, who started it, why it closed, uh, is a mystery to some people. Some people think it's haunted. You'll find suggestion stations with pencil and paper placed throughout the exhibit. Another popular recommendation, uncovering Griffith Park's ancient Tongva villages. The more you dig, the more you kind of excavate all these layers of a rich past. Curator Carolyn Brucken takes us on a tour of what the Griffith Park exhibit offers so far. 
Before the Autry Museum, most people don't realize what was on this site was a World War II veterans housing village. And so this is what we see some of the pictures from the Roger Young village that was built in 1947, housed over 6,000 people at one point um, as a response to the need for emergency housing um, for veterans returning from World War II. How long did this go on? Between about 1947 to about 1954. See, I would have never, I've been to Griffith Park hundreds of times, I have never would have well, known that. Well, because there's nothing left except for maybe one Quonset hut that we think is the one used by the Trails Cafe. And then before Roger Young Village, there was actually a National Guard airfield on this site. Um, and there were hangars that were leased by people who were at the beginning of the aerospace industry in California. Uh, you're saying that planes took off from here? Uh-huh. Wow. And so there's like just this one spot, and then before that it was one. It was a Mexican rancho, and before that it had ancestral villages from Tongva people. And you thought Griffith Park was just hiking trails and the observatory. So many stories told and waiting to be told at the Autry Museum of the American West. That's at 4700 Western Heritage Way, across from the LA Zoo entrance in beautiful and mysterious Griffith Park. The Investigating Griffith Park exhibit is expected to be completed in 2021. Until then, the museum is inviting you to stop by, offer suggestions, and maybe learn a thing or two. Local leaders urge the city to preserve LA's trees. Need some free tax prep? A city program may be able to help. And ever thought about collecting and recycling rainwater? Well, it's easy, and the city can help. All this in City B. Need help with your taxes but can't really afford a professional? Mayor Eric Garcetti has launched the Free Tax Prep LA campaign aimed at helping low to moderate income households get the tax credits and refunds they are entitled to. For more, visit freetaxprepla.com. The impact of climate change is now being felt by the very trees lining our streets. Shockingly, up to 30% of LA's green canopy is in danger of being lost within the next decade if immediate action is not taken. LA controller Ron Galperin and Councilman Bob Blumenfield stress the importance of getting ahead of the problem now. These trees are our lungs. They clean the air for us. They are the ultimate infrastructure when you think about it. Councilwoman Monica Rodriguez sponsored the annual rain collection barrel giveaway in Pacoima. Since the program's inception five years ago, over 1,500 barrels have been distributed, saving countless gallons of water that would otherwise be wasted. These days, bullying in school is a serious issue many kids and parents face. That's why the Harlem Globetrotters and the LAPD are using their hoop skills to encourage kids to stand up and speak out. The Globetrotters, we're known as the ambassadors of goodwill. So we go into a community, it's not just about basketball, it's also about having a positive impact. And we found that the number one complaint students have in school today is that there's too much bullying. And so we want to do our part to help with that. Do you guys think that the number one problem students face is too much pizza? Do you think that the number one problem students face is too much recess? The number one problem that students face today in schools is bullying. A lot of our students feel bullied and for them to be able to have a voice and a mechanism to identify it and to address it is important. Are we going to team up against bullying? Today we are partnered up with the Harlem Globetrotters. We want to make sure that, you know, the next generation isn't afraid to connect with the police and, you know, let them know that we are here for them. You okay, man? Uh, no, somebody bully you? Yes. Why you bullying him? He a nice guy. Don't... I'm messing with you. Can I be your friend? Yes. Put Anthony down. We give the message that everyone in the school, staff, teachers, and students are all one team, and that helps the kids to look out for each other and really support each other. Not allowing someone to play a sport because of the color of their skin or because of their gender is a form of bullying. We can come together as a community to really solve the issues that surround our youth. <laughs> Here we go. 
It's a platform where films by Asians and Pacific Islanders can be showcased and promoted at USC. It's also an opportunity to inspire other up-and-coming filmmakers. Check it out. I see now why they gave me ribbons of shame. Because I was beginning to think like American. Ha! <laughs> hey, don't flatter yourself, Ace. It's true! Everybody in this country thinks they are special. It's the second annual USC Asian Pacific Film Festival. We host here both a panel of industry professionals brought in by very famous Asian and Asian American representatives, as well as a screening of student and alumni films. A lot of the problem with student organizations and student filmmaking now is that there's no avenue to really screen them or any way to present them. So in order to have this film festival, it gives them a place to sort of elaborate on their art, demonstrate their work, as well as connect with an industry networks. We have invited API actors and filmmakers from the film industry to come here and speak today um, on a panel, but they're also our jury members. Come on! No, we fight to death. <laughs> This platform is super important to any, you know, Asian, Asian American, Pacific Islander who just wants to get their stories told, who wants to showcase their talent. And more importantly, it's just giving legitimacy to these films. USC is a great community to have. And I mean, I would never th have thought that a film that I shot in India, wrote in Singapore, would have been finished in America. So I think we're really living in a time where it's global and I'm just excited to, you know, make work with these talented people here. Electronic music artist Moby is honored. Check out some wacky art at a new exhibit and help clean up the environment during a beach day cleanup. All this and things to do. You're invited to the 2019 Adopt the Art, Sound and Vision Award Benefit Gala. This year, EDM artist Moby is recognized by the Los Angeles-based charity for his work as a musician, artist and activist. Don't miss the party as Adopt the Arts honors Moby on Thursday, March 7th at 7 p.m. The gala will take place at the Wiltern Theater on 3790 Wilshire Boulevard. For more information, visit adopttheart.org. La Luz de Jesus Gallery proudly presents the 33rd annual La Luza Palooza, showcasing established and undiscovered artists. The gigantic No Theme Group art show features carefully handpicked works from thousands of submissions. Get a load of what's happening in the local art scene at La Luza Palooza beginning March 1st at 4633 Hollywood Boulevard. For details, visit laluzdejesus.com. The first of the month means it's time for beach cleanup at Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. Join aquarium staff and volunteers in clearing the shore of marine debris. Help put the environment first at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium Beach Cleanup, Saturday, March 2nd. The aquarium is located at 3720 Stephen M. White Drive. You can register to help by calling 310-548-7562. And that's a look at some things to do. Well, that's it for this edition. I'm Yana Kay. From all of us here at LA This Week, thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. See you next time for more of LA This Week.
Fridays. The public is welcome. Madam Clerk, we do have a quorum. Would you please call the roll? Blumenfield, Bonin, Biscayino, Cedillo, Harris-Dawson, Wiesa, Coretz, Krikorin, Martinez, O'Farrell, Price, Rodriguez, Rue, Smith, Wesson. Eleven members present and a quorum, Mr. President. Great. First order of business. Approval of the minutes. Coretz moves, Bonin seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Martinez moves and O'Farrell seconds. That brings us where? Mr. President, today is Tuesday and time for the flag salute. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. O'Farrell to lead us today in our flag salute. If all would please rise. Thank you, Mr. President. Please place your hand on your heart. Ready, begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much, Mr. O'Farrell. Madam Clerk, why don't we go through the agenda at this time? Mr. President, there is a request to continue item one for one week to March 5th. So ordered. Next, items one through 31 are items for which public hearings have been held. Specials members, let's then, uh, Ms. Rodriguez. Item 26 special. Let's hold 26. Mr. Uh, Wizar. 31. 31. Mr. Buscaino. 18. 18. Thank you. All right. Let us prepare to vote on the uh, remaining issues. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 eyes. Ms. Rodriguez. Item 2, forthwith. Item 2, forthwith. Let's continue, Madam Clerk. And Mr. President, that takes council back to presentations or items called special or general public comment. Thank you. Okay, what I'm gonna do is take a few uh, general public comment cards at this time. So if I can get Ellie Farmer, Renice Edwards, please come forward. Yes, so identify yourself. Hi, good morning, my name is Renice Edwards. Um, I live at 1611 Schrader Boulevard. Uh, it's a corner of Selma and Schrader. Um, I am a p here to, to, uh, cause, because I'm opposed of the Dream 2 Selma Hotel project. The company behind this project, Relevant Group, has called their set of hotel projects an urban resort that they are building according to their website to regentrify Hollywood. Well, their plan has gone too long and something, someone has to hit the brakes. Over 700 hotel rooms um, and all the new construction all outside my door disrupting what used to be a quiet side street. Um, I respectfully ask the council to deny all request approvals for the project until a full environmental impact report of all cumulative impact has prepared and shown to the public. Thank you. Next speaker, please come forward and identify yourself. Hello, Council. My name is Al Farmer. I'm speaking today on behalf of 30,000 members of Unite Here Local 11. Uh, I am here to express our continued opposition to the Dream 2 Hotel Project, also known as the Summer Hotel Project. I ask the Council to use its discretion today to decline to certify any requested entitlements and the M&D at this time. Uh, this project is part of one massive enterprise, hundreds and hundreds of hotel rooms re-gentrifying, in their own words, uh, a single uh, square, block, you know, square block area of Hollywood. Um, the notion of that plan and the piecemealing of these five hotel projects and a dozen bars over the course of a few years is very clear and extensive. The record uh, is replete with this information from myself and other commenters. Um, I urge you today, do not certify the M&D for this project. Do not move this project forward at all. It needs a full EIR for all of the cumulative impacts that this massive hotel district project is causing on Selma and Wilcox. Thank you. 
Thank you. Daniel Wright and Angel or Angel, please come forward. I get to make a public comment? Yes, yes. your name? Ana Luisa Rincón de Feria, a.k.a. Angel. My familia is Mexican government, Mendiola, and also American government. My ID number is B61709444. I lost that ID number, the actual ID, but that's me. If not, you could take my prints. Uh, Señor Wizard, gracias por todo su trabajo en el sereno. Lo quiero mucho. Uh, for you that don't know Spanish, learn. He can translate for you, or whoever the translator is. With that said, yes, Mr. President, say you. Thank you. For? I haven't said a word. You, uh, I was just saying hi to Wizard. Yes, sir. Waiting. I talk now? No, you comment, been, public you, comment, right? Okay, your your I'm time is up. Oh. You get one minute. Yeah, everybody gets one minute. Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright, please come forward. Mr. Wright, please come forward. Thank you for coming, ma'am. Next speaker, Mr. Wright. Shh, the floor is yours. Daniel Wright, um, council members, actually the last speaker just raised an interesting question. She said, you gotta give me the rules so that I know how to um, conform to them. That is an ongoing problem at this city council. I wanted to uh, simply uh, raise the concern of your recent change in policy of not providing members of the public with paper copies of your agenda at the back of the room. I do see that you do have a screen, but um, I would remind you that there are certain obligations under the Americans with Disabilities Act that may require you to notify the public of the availability of, of the agenda in alternative forms for people who cannot use your screen. Um, additionally, the inability of people to have a paper copy at a public meeting, which is unheard of in any public meeting across this state, can only be also designed to suppress speech. So please consider Thank you. those items. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Wright. Okay, it's my understanding there's been a request to reconsider item 12. So let's vote on reconsideration. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Thank you. Mr. Buscaino, and I, I don't want anybody to think that uh, public comment is over. It is not. I just wanted to take some of you earlier. So I'm going to recognize Mr. Uh, Buscaino. And Mr. Harris Dawson, you're part of this as yes. well? Yes, please. Thank you. Come on up. Mata. Like that Chief Moore here, Chief Beck, please come forward. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honoring the legacy and life that was uh, his service to the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, Deputy Chief Phil Tingredes, let's give him a round of applause. It gives me great honor. I've had uh, the privilege to know Phil for many, many years. Um, we go way back in our harbor days. Uh, when he was a gang sergeant and I was a senior lead officer and worked hand-in-hand -hand with he and, and his, his officers. Um, this is a uh, sad moment for us in this city. We are losing a, um, a person who has dedicated uh, over 25 years of service to the Los Angeles Police Department and to our great city. Deputy Chief Phil Tingredes um, began his career set out a path of public service by protecting his nation first as the United States Army in, in his service to the U.S. Army. In 1980, he began, um, he began what would become a long and successful career 
in the Los Angeles Police Department in the Southeast Division. I was in kindergarten there in 1980, just for the record. I don't know. <laughs> there you are. In 2007, he was appointed as a senior area captain for Watts, where uh, exemplary work became uh, internationally recognized. Now, Chief Tingridis embodies the LAPD's mission and core values in reverence for the law and community service, respect for others. I want to uh, now turn your attention to the video clip we're about to uh, play here. It captures the beginning of Chief Tingridis' leadership in the Watts community. <laughs> December of 2005, we had a bad year where seven young men was murdered within a month, which was in Nickerson. The kids in that community couldn't even go out and play. It frustrated the whole community. One day we was out and we ran into Janice Hahn. We kind of told her that day, how could you ignore these young people being murdered in this community? And you guys, it's not even paying attention. She called an emergency meeting where we'll meet at her office on Monday. So then, all of a sudden, Janet come walking in the door on that Monday with law enforcement. And so we was kind of upset because we supposed to be sitting down with you, not law enforcement. LAPD uh, did not at that point necessarily have the, you know, the philosophy of, of engaging community. Um, it was more of a, of a suppression uh, philosophy. Um, and because of that, there was a history of, of really difficult, you know, incidents, a lack of trust, um, people feeling like sometimes the police were acting more like a, a, an occupying force rather than, you know, a, a, an entity that's supposed to protect and serve them. We went at it. We fussed. Uh, we, we blamed them. And all of a sudden, Phil, Tegan Reed, has come in the room and he apologized for law enforcement. But I love my job, he said, but I wear a badge that really hurt this community. And I don't want y'all to take that from what I want to do to help change this community. I first met him at one of the Watts Gang Task Force meetings, and he was Captain T. Greedy at the time, Captain T. He was um, the head, really, of LAPD here in the community um, and brought a lot of calm and peace um, but also dealt with a lot of challenges that were brought up from community partners as well as family members who have lost someone in the community. And I think that that's one of his great skills, that he is able to get people who are in very challenging situations to simply listen. So colleagues, <laughs> clearly, you see the lasting impact Chief Tingridi's made in the Watts community. He's recognized that his priority in the area was to build trust between the community and the LAPD and do it as quickly as possible. And uh, this drive to find solutions um, came from the fact that Chief Tingridis believed in our Watts community. But I would be remiss not to mention his partner and his wife, Lieutenant Amada Tingridis, who were also fortunate to have here with us. And they actually got married in the Tom Bradley Tower. So let's give Amada a round of applause. This is. A teamwork that makes a dream work right here. We love you. It was together that they were able to develop the trust and relationships that have made their work in Watts an international model for community-based policing. In, in my involvement, colleagues with the National League of Cities, uh, colleagues and municipal leaders from around the country are struggling with community-based policing models. And when they come to me in Los, uh, about what we've done in Los Angeles, I turn to what we've done with the Watts Gang Task Force as well as a community safety partnership program and that has uh, driven other municipal leaders around the country to follow this model. These two started the community-based group, the Watts Gang Task Force, to create a stronger and safer Watts. And in 2011, they created this community safety partnership and built a team of officers who made relationship building their number one priority. And as a part of the Community Safety Partnership, Chief and Lieutenant Tingridis established the Watts Bears football team and the local Girl Scout troop. And these investments created spaces where dividing lines didn't matter. And as a result, positive relationships started from between the community and members of the LAPD. 
we saw a dramatic reduction of violent crime in Watts. Lives were saved. Uh, this would not have been possible without the risk taken by both Chief Tingridis and Lieutenant Tingridis. Uh, they have held us all to higher standards, improved accountability, and clearly enhanced transparency. But this is not the end of the long list of accomplishments for Chief Tingridis. In 2014, he earned his degree in criminal justice from National University. His work has been recognized a multitude of times. He and Amata are the recipients of the 2015 Governing Magazine's Public Officials of the Year. Then in 2016, the Helene and Joseph Sherwood Prize from the Anti-Defamation League for Combating Hate. Uh, the Chief and Lieutenant Tigridis were even invited to President Obama's State of the Union Address where they were honored for their work with the Community Safety Partnership Program. Um, an incredible career within law enforcement, um, police legitimacy, public trust, uh, police uh, community relations. This is this is the progress we clearly want in our city, not only in the Watts community in South Los Angeles, but citywide. And this is what Chief Tingridis embodied. Uh, Chief T, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we honor you, we honor your service, and we honor your legacy and you're truly going to be missed, not only in the Watts community, but throughout the city of Los Angeles. Um, before I call up my colleague, um, Marquise harris and I do want to recognize some folks who are here. You heard me mention our police chief, Michael Moore, our retired police chief, Charlie Beck, um, Chief Bob Green, um, Assistant Chief Beatrice Gramala, Assistant Chief Bobby Arcos, um, Commander Dominic Choi, Chief Mike Blake Chow, um, Chief T's mom, Ms. Doretha Goodard, uh, Mrs. Sue Grev Tingridis, Chief T's sister, and Ms. Georgia Baron Tingridis, um, Chief T's sister as well. Let's give them all a round of applause for joining us here to honor Chief Tingridis. So with that, help me welcome Councilmember Marquise harris Dawson. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you so much, Councilmember Buscaino, for allowing me to be a part of this very bittersweet uh, presentation uh, to recognize the service uh, and the retirement of our own uh, Chief Tingarides, who I will, for the duration of my uh, time at this podium, uh, call by his, his street name, which is Chief T. Uh, we had the honor of working with, with Chief T from the start of being on uh, the LA City Council. Uh, a neighborhood in my district called Harvard Park uh, had been deemed by the Los Angeles Times the most dangerous blocks in the city of Los Angeles. We'd had eight homicides over the past few years, innumerable, innumerable, innumerable violent crimes. The uh, victims and perpetrators were almost exclusively African-American males. Historically, in that neighborhood, just like everywhere else in South LA that I'd ever known of, uh, the relationship between LAPD and the community had been hostile. Both uh, homeowners had their level of hostility, young people had their hostility, activists had uh, their hostility. And so when we started to organize the community, and, and we had a big community meeting with 500 people um, in, during the month of August in 2016 to, 2015 to respond to this, there were so many people in the community who said, I'll participate in your meeting, but only if Chief T is there. Wow. That's the only way we're going to sit down and have dialogue. And so we had that dialogue, and that dialogue resulted in, uh, with the help of, help of the Balmer Foundation and the leadership of Chief Beck, we implemented the community safety partnership that had been pioneered in Watts in the Harvard Park neighborhood, which was tricky because that neighborhood is not a housing development. The homes are owned by homeowners and renters, um, just like any other neighborhood in the, in the community. Well, since that time, uh, and this is an amazing testament to the work of Chief T and Amada and all the officers there in the community safety partnership, in the first year, of the implementation of the Community Safety Partnership, we went from being one of the most violent sets of blocks in the city to having zero violent crime calls of any kind. 
So, so we can't uh, say enough about your gift to the city and, and, and what you have meant to us. Uh, we recognize, this doesn't get talked about a lot, but you're, you're a son of South LA, yes. uh, 110th Street, um, and has um, shown, besides being an expert on police, you do the one thing that other people can't copy. It has to be real, and that is that you love the people. Uh, and that shows, and so I'm proud to be a part of this uh, celebration. As someone who started my political life picketing LAPD, I'm happy to be here to champion one of LAPD's own, our own Chief Tingaritis. Thank you so much. And so uh, we have a little presentation uh, that we want to give uh, Council Member Buscaino on behalf of the uh, citizens of South LA and our family at Lock High School. They decided to give you a Lock High School football jersey. Right. That's in the center of it all. So there you see. It's, uh, I tried it on, so it's a little snug, so you have to keep working out uh, in order to do it. So thank you so much, Chief T. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Marquise. Help me welcome now uh, Chief of Police. No, well, before, oh. before you do that, yes. uh, Mr. Busca, you know, I have a few members that want to speak. Please. And before I recognize Mr. Price, uh, just let me say that, um, of course, I appreciate your service, yours and Amada's service to the city of L.A., but I'm really not happy. You're going to be, <laughs> you are going to be missed. You, I, it's got to be, and I wonder, and I hope that there's a group of people somewhere that feel about me the way they feel about you. It's got to be special for you to know that you're not liked. You are beloved by people in our part of town. And so I don't know why you need to go. <laughs> don't want you to go. Wish we could introduce a motion forbidding you from leaving. But I just want to say that you're one of the best men that I've ever met and you will be missed and from the bottom of my heart i thank you for all of the service that you provided to the people of la that we all love so so very much thanks chief t thank you <laughs> mr price thank thank you mr president i too want to just join my colleagues in uh, saying goodbye chief, chief t you've been a just a remarkable source and resource uh, in our community not just in watts uh, throughout all South LA uh, and, and our city. And whether it's the, uh, the CSP partnership, which, is, which has been an extraordinary program, a testament to you and, uh, and your, your wife and the team, uh, it's made a real big difference, uh, first in Watts, uh, now at Harvard Park, and we're excited that you're gonna be coming to South Park. Uh, and it's that kind of spirit of collaboration and cooperation that has really made a difference, and that's why uh, you are built so beloved. And so we're going to miss you, we value you, we, we have an inkling, though, that you still may be around. We still, there will be some sightings of you, uh, and, and uh, certainly well deserve it. So, but congratulations, keep up the good work. I understand 39 years yesterday, yesterday right. on the force. That's legacy, that's history. We love you. Thank you. Thank you. He could have sooner. He could Any other members? Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. President. Chief T, I had the great pleasure of joining uh, my colleague, Mr. Marquise Harris Dawson, in Watts and at Harvard Park yesterday. And all I heard was your name. That's all I heard. And it was with such respect and appreciation for your legacy of service. But even beyond the community members that were saying such wonderful things about your leadership style and Amata yours as well, uh, and, and the mark that you've left there in the community is really a reflection of everything that this department is and, and you really have the heart and soul of what we know so many members signed on to do. And it was reflective in some of the members of the CSP that are at Harvard Park. Mm -hmm. Your leadership and your legacy will continue because you've left an indelible mark in this community. And so I appreciate that as we embark upon rolling out a CSP in my district. I know that your legacy, your practice, has been instrumental in helping to shape how we move forward as a city when it comes to community-based policing. And so I'm incredibly grateful 
for you, for your service to our city, and uh, wish you the very best in retirement. Thank you for all of your years of service. Okay, Mr. Buskai, you know, but I think we have to put one caveat here. We may be forced to let the chief go, but we're not letting the lieutenant go. Okay, she, <laughs> That's right. She's we have stay. a lot of. All right, the floor is yours. Thank you. Help me welcome Chief Michael Moore. Good morning, council members. I am pleased to be here today, but also uh, saddened, as, you, as many members have indicated here, 39 years of service by a man who has been transformational. Many of us go through a career, and, and we start in a particular uh, niche, if you will, and work our way uh, during our entire course, and not much has changed, except for maybe the hairline. Uh, this is a man that, in his time with an LAPD, has seen the transformation of LAPD but, and, its, and its relationship with the communities it served, and has not just seen it, but has been a driver of it. Uh, there's many things that can go. Uh, you can look in books, you can do research and, and ask around, but here's a man who actually delivers. And he delivers both in the community as well as with the rank and file and with the leadership of LAPD. And that is a unique blend of just not just competence, but his character and his character of concern, his empathy, his truly, he's a genuine individual that I have enjoyed working with and, and alongside for, for many years. And in, at the same time, it's bittersweet recognizing that at this point in time, there's a house remodel that's drawing him. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I looked up, uh, there's a couple contractors we know, there's a lot of things we offered, but unfortunately we could not con continue, we couldn't ask him to continue. Uh, so we're allowing him to take this next chapter. But Councilman Wesson, Council President, as you indicated, the, the heartened part about this is we still have Lieutenant uh, Amada Tingarides is here. And so we still have that, that, uh, that DNA, if you will, that the, the formula, the magic juice that is allowing us to continue in such important matters. 15 years ago, with the start of the Watts Gang Task Force, as was said, police officers were not seen as problem solvers. They were many times seen uh, and misunderstood, but in interpreted as obstacles and things that would get in the way of a community being safe. People such as Phil, Amada, and others, people that he has taught, mentored, and has shown the way to bring up the next generation of outstanding LAPD leadership, uh, he has been an, an author of that, and I look forward to his continued work with us. He has not done, as been said, the Community Safety Partnership, which is just the most recent addition of our neighborhood level uh, efforts to build trust and build uh, the ability to work with communities and communities work with us and all the stakeholders uh, will grow and continue. And I look forward to Chief Tangarides and his continued involvement in the history and how, uh, how does that work and how, does, how can it work and the criticality of it being a, a full-hearted effort by each leader who touches that program. So it is, uh, it is bittersweet that we see this today, but it is also, I am proud, as I stand uh, on behalf of a number of our senior staff as well as our rank and file, that we also stand amongst us a family, a family of the T family. And this is a, a proud moment for me uh, because as a chief, and Chief Beck will, will, will uh, have moments here to also reflect and provide information. But as we go through this career, too many times we see people who are successful, but they put it all on the street. And unfortunately, their ability to maintain and balance and keep a family together and a family supportive and a family that they support, uh, we see those as casualties. And I want to respect and, and give you my salute for your ability, both as a husband and, and, and as a father and as a son and as a relative, for you doing it the right way. And that as you leave here, you have a family support you, continue to, to embrace you. And to the family members, thank you. This is an organization that we pull and we pull and we pull. And we know the sacrifices that are made. And, I, and on behalf of a grateful department, thank you for lending us here for this period of time. God bless you for that. And uh, I know we're not, giving, we're not giving him back to you in the same shape you gave him, but, uh, <laughs> but he's, got a, he's got an irreplaceable smile. <laughs> God bless you. And with that, I'm going to take the, uh, the liberty please, please. Of, yeah. of introducing a man who is, needs no introduction, but is somebody that I enjoy uh, still having the occasion to, uh, uh, to seek his advice and counsel, uh, and a friend of the LAPD, a friend of the city of Los Angeles. That is the 56th Chief of Police, Chief Charlie Beck. Welcome, Chief. 
Welcome. Well, first, uh, to the council, thank you for allowing me to speak without putting in a card. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> My one minute, yeah. Uh, I am primarily here today to assure Phil that all of the things that you are saying are wrong, that there is life after this job, and that he will enjoy and succeed just as he has while working. You know, the LAPD that, uh, that uh, Phil and I came up in is a much different organization than the one that he leaves. And that evolution and transformation is one of the most remarkable things about the history of this city, is the way your police department has changed. And Phil, maybe more than, than any of us, embodies that change. You know, th this um, community-oriented, um, empathetic, uh, polished individual that you say goodbye to is not the knucklehead Phil that I knew uh, when he was a young police officer. And to see him evolve, and not, and not only evolve, because, because there are many of us that evolve, but embrace that evolution the way Phil does. You know, he you know, he not only drank the, uh, the CSP Community Policing Partnership Kool-Aid, you know, he gargled it. He, he, it runs through his veins. This is not him um, reflecting what the chief wants or reflecting what he thinks the council wants or the, the, the flavor of the day in policing. This is now Phil's heart and soul. And you know that was that was always my goal, is to create police officers who not only did what you wanted, but wanted what you did. You know, and and that's what what uh, Phil has been. And and you know, uh, I just can't thank him enough. You know, every time I would get frustrated or worried about which way the LAPD was going, you know, I would look back and I would I would see Phil, and I would know that uh, that we were on the right path. You know. And, what, what I will say, I'll close with this because n nothing's worse than an old chief talking, but I will close with this. You know, Phil will soon learn that even though we all know that Amada was in charge when he was at home, that he has got a whole new, you, now you go to the bottom of the food chain. Phil. <laughs> you will be the low man on the totem pole uh, behind all the kids <laughs> and, under, and, and Amada will make sure that, that, you, that you perform the same way Mike does now. <laughs> so, well, thank you for letting me talk, and, and you know, I, I can't say uh, how much I love Phil, you know, and, and love his contributions and love what he represents. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, help me welcome a man who's given 39 years of service to the LAPD in this great city, Deputy Chief Phil Tingridis. Uh, I, I really, I have one message, and, and I'll start off with Joe. Thank you, Joe, for doing this. Um, uh, Marquise, thank you so much. Uh, the partnership, um, uh, Councilman Price and Herb Weston, the, the partnership that I had with you guys was like I've never seen. The, the, the group right now of elected officials has a very different mentality of going out and doing. And, and I, I couldn't tell you how much I appreciate that and how much that helped us all to, to become one. And you know, I want to thank Chief Beck. Chief Beck, um, when I got to Southeast in 2007 and became the area CEO, I was the sixth area CEO in five years. Mm -hmm. And he told me I was going to be there until I retired, I died, or promoted. And I didn't have a degree, so he knew I couldn't promote. I really didn't want to die. And uh, I had way too many kids to retire back then. And so I ended up at Southeast for eight years, and I want to thank Chief Beck for leaving me there. I, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart, because without having been there for that amount of time, change could not have occurred. Because what changed in policing in, in Watson and South LA was the relationship. And that relationship takes a long time to create because within that you have to have trust. 
And so I want to thank the officers who worked CSP and who worked along with me because they, they embodied that. But more than anything, I want to thank the community, the community of Watts of South LA, who, when things were very frustrating, very traumatic, they opened their hearts and their lives to us. And that was so important to create peace. And I, I, I look now at the, at the numbers of violent crime in South LA, and it's just incredible because they're gone. And that's not something I did, that's something we all did together. And, and Chief Moore, I thank you. you I know that, that continuing the CSP program is important to you. Um, I want to thank my mom. My mom, who grew up at 98th and LaSalle, um, she has just been a pillar for me. But more than anything, I have to check, uh, thank my partner, Captain Tingery. Did I say that? Oh. No. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Amada. Because she has been such an amazing partner. She has been with me every step of the way. Her heart is part of the city too. And together, um, we not only we not only worked together with the community to make change, but we did it with a lot of love for each other and for the community that we both grew up in. And so with that, I will say that yesterday, 39 years ago yesterday, my dreams came true because I became a Los Angeles police officer and it was my goal in life to be that. And I can truly say that I'm walking away feeling like the sand is a little cleaner than it was when I first stepped on it. Thank you. So with that, on behalf of the entire city council, Mayor Garcetti, we recognize Chief Tingridis, the heart behind the badge here in the 39 years of service to the city of Los Angeles. This one more round of applause.
sergeants, I'm going to take a couple of more public uh, comments uh, before we go to our next presentation. If I can get Gavin, is it Gavin Pierce? Jed uh, Poker or Parker, Parker, Vicky, Kersenbaum, please come forward. Please come and identify yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gavin Pierce. I work with uh, SoCal 350 Climate Action and the Sunrise Movement. Um, I'm also a board member on the Neighborhood Council in Highland Park, but am here today speaking as an individual, not for the board. Um, and I, I want to start by thanking um, the city for all of the work it's done to get us towards 100% renewables and to uh, not invest in additional gas plants and repowering them. Um, and I want to also encourage the city to ensure that we get to 100% renewable energy by 2030. Um, we're incredibly short on time when it comes to climate change. We're talking about an extinction event um, and really, really drastic outcomes if we, if we don't act quickly. And um, I don't believe 2050, 2045, any date other than 2030 at the latest to be adequate. Um, so I just ask the city to keep up the momentum on the climate action we've been taking. Thank you. Yes, sir. Identify yourself. Thank you. My name is Jed Pauker. I'm a Venice resident and former neighborhood council member whose internal renewal, renewable energy was turned to national issues in 2016 and whose top priority now is human survival, as should be yours. Councilmember Bonin affirmed at last week's Marina del Rey Sierra Club meeting that our common existential clean energy issue brings together city populations nationwide. San Diego, New Hampshire, Vermont have already initiated successful and cost-saving job-creating clean energy initiatives. Los Angeles can <clears throat> and should catch up and lead the way. Mr. Bonin rightly wants colleagues to hear from constituents. Well, here we are. We proved that positive, organized, passionate public in the 2018 midterm elections can have that influence. We moved our own senior U.S. Senator in the past and with the help and persistence of Sunrise Movement, Food and Water Watch, Indivisible, and many other groups. Thank we'll you. Move Thank you. Okay. Yes. Hi, my name is Vicki Kirschenbaum. I strongly urge council to request LADWP go to 100% renewable energy by 2030. The utility's recent announcement that it will not repower three local gas plants is a welcome step forward, but I urge you to request the utility not invest in repowering the IPP coal plant in Utah as a gas plant. Make no long-term investments in gas. I was present at the uh, recent public meeting of the LADWP Board of Commissioners, had the opportunity to hear David Freeman speak, a man who has decades of experience and is a former general manager of LADWP. He said the utility is perfectly capable of replacing gas with renewables and battery storage, joining KISO to increase transmission options. Climate change is speeding toward us like a freight train, and turning our backs on fossil fuels is the only way to avoid catastrophe. Thank you. In fact, Mr. Harris Dawson, I didn't see you get back in. Are you prepared to? So at this point, I'd like to recognize Mr. Marquise Harris Dawson for our next presentation. Shh. Mr. Harris Dawson, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. Um, we have a couple presentations today, so uh, we're got our running shoes on. Uh, but we thank you for accommodating us. I, I uh, asked my colleagues, Mr. Koretz and Mr. Kikorian, to join us uh, today. Before we start, Does I Mr. just Kikorian wanted to Mr. Kikorian have his running shoes on? Yeah, I know. Uh, yes. <laughs> next time. Next time. Do, <laughs> uh, before uh, we get started with this presentation, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, my colleagues and all of your staffs. Uh, we had closed the deal here a couple of weeks ago. We asked everybody to donate suits and ties and shirts. We're very proud to announce that we collected over a ton of men's clothing uh, to give well, away. round so of applause. Big round of yeah. applause for everybody. 
and uh, the organization is just very, very excited uh, about that. And, and in the same vein, uh, giving uh, folks the opportunity to build a life here in the city of Los Angeles, uh, our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, giving them the opportunity to be full participates, participants in this uh, community that we call LA. One thing that the three of us and the mayor's office have been strongly behind is the targeted local hire program. Uh, this is a program that seeks out uh, community members who want to work, who have the possibility of working, who live in some of our uh, districts and some of our neighborhoods that uh, people struggle with high unemployment. And so uh, myself, along with uh, our budget chair, Mr. Kokorian, our, our uh, personnel committee chair, Mr. Koretz, and the mayor, uh, we've pushed this uh, issue. We go on a quarterly basis to hear report backs uh, from all of the departments in the city to see what they've done about uh, targeted local hire. And so today we want to mark the second anniversary of the uh, targeted local hire program and we want to recognize some people uh, that have played a special role in making it real. And at the end we've got a big announcement to make about how many people have gotten jobs as a result of the targeted local hire program. So first, uh, I wanna invite my colleagues to speak. Uh, Mr. Kokorian, uh, who's been on the case and helped us remove barriers and blockades to getting our folks uh, eligible to work for the city of Los Angeles. Mr. Kokorian. Thank you very much, Mr. Harris Dawson, and uh, thank you for your great leadership uh, in this area. Uh, Charles Dickens described the London and Paris of the 19th century as places of both um, incredible opportunity and abject hopelessness in A Tale of Two Cities. And the, probably the most famous be opening line of any novel was, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And in many respects, Los Angeles in 2019 can be similarly described. Uh, this is a time of incredible economic success in this city. We are breaking all records for tourism and new business and unemployment is at uh, rock bottom uh, levels. Uh, our port is breaking all records. Our airport is breaking all records. So in many ways, this is a time of great economic success. But at the same time, we also know that there are uh, an increasing number of our brothers and sisters who are sleeping in the shadows of those gleaming glass towers that we're building, um, who are living under bridges and who have no hope to participate in that bright economic future. So what targeted local hire has done is given an opportunity for the people who are struggling the most with hopelessness giving them an opportunity to come into a real career of employment with this city so that hopefully, instead of sleeping on sidewalks, they'll be fixing sidewalks. Hopefully, they'll be able to have a better future for themselves and their families, and they'll be a part of this city family in delivering the services that we all want to deliver to our constituents. So um, this has been a great partnership between this council and our mayor, uh, who's had a vision for how to, to bring more people into the city's workforce and in, in, I guess I, I want to say also that as we face kind of a crisis situation of homelessness, of um, wage disparity, of um, uh, unemployment for uh, those who uh, lack skills, as we face this crisis, we have to also remember that you should never waste a crisis. And our brothers and sisters in labor, yeah. and in particular, the irrepressible and um, uh, always uh, energetic and always, um, uh, uh, well, I, I can't come up with enough adjectives for Jackie Goldberg, yeah. who, who, will, who will never hear the word no. She will never even hear it. Not only does she not take it for an answer, it doesn't even register. And there is nobody who we should have had involved in, the, in making this program real and implementing it more than Jackie Goldberg, who has made this vision real for the people that have participated and part people who will continue to participate in this program. So for that, I want to thank all of our brothers and sisters in labor for thinking differently at a time of crisis, and especially to Jackie Goldberg for implementing that and making it real, and to my colleagues, Mr. Harris Dawson and Mr. Kretz, for insisting that our departments, each and every one of them, 
steps up and participates in this program and, and makes it a success. So thank you very much, thank Mr. Harris Dawson. Thank you, Mr. Kokorian. And now we'll hear from the chair of our personnel committee, Council Member Paul Koretz. Well, this, is, this has obviously been the right program at the right time. And we're facing uh, a lot of potential retirements in this city. If you exclude sworn and DWP, um, somewhere between a fifth and a quarter of our workforce is looking at retirement or is at least of retirement age every year, year over year at, at this time. And so we have a lot of opportunities and at the same time, we have a great new program. Well, new in that it's two years old, um, but uh, it's one that allows us to hire the formerly incarcerated, hire folks that went through the foster youth program, uh, hire the homeless, and hire people that are perfectly capable of doing the job, but never otherwise would have gotten that opportunity. And we found through this project that some of our managers are very hesitant, in fact, maybe most of them um, at the start. But uh, once they actually started hiring from this pool, they didn't find that they were just as good. In many cases, they found that they were a lot better. This is a workforce that is excited to have a job, that is dedicated, that is enthusiastic. I mean, we heard reports of people trying to sneak in early to work to put in some extra time without anybody noticing. <laughs> I mean, you, you don't find that anywhere else. And uh, I particularly want to thank uh, LAWA because they were, they were the department that really stepped forward and found the great success and really was the example for other departments to follow. Now, we have been a little bit slow and bureaucratic, and uh, I know uh, the mayor and and uh, Mr. Harris Dawson and Mr. Krikorian and myself had to kind of beat people up and have them report back and show their lack of success until they were able to report on their actual success. <laughs> and, and I thank you, Mr. Harris Dawson in particular for really becoming the champion of, of this program. But this has been such a great program. Um, I also have to join Mr. Kokorian in thanking Jackie Goldberg for yes. making this possible. Couldn't have been done otherwise. And it's rare when you, when you pick someone for any kind of position that you actually have the best possible person, but I think we had the perfect person in the city to do this, and that's partly responsible for what is now a tremendous success. So I, I want to recognize our two years of success I look forward to much, much more. I thank uh, the Coalition for City Unions also for pushing for this and creating an incredible program and the personnel department for pushing to make this happen as well. This is a great success and, and I'm, I'm very proud to join you up here in recognizing it. Thank you, Mr. Koretz. Um, rolling on, this, this program, Mr. President, was actually in place when I joined the City Council, and you know that I made local hire a, a, a big priority. And so when we went to the mayor's office and said, we want to hire our people, we want to put them to work, uh, he said, well, we got just a program. And uh, he opened the door and let all of our offices really make that program our own and put our arms around it and push for it. And so we want to thank and recognize uh, the mayor and leader of our city, uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti. Joining us today is our Deputy Mayor, Matt Zabo, to speak on his behalf. All right, let's give Matt a round of applause. Uh, and Matt, you. before you start, just let me say this quickly. The, this, the coalition grabbed onto this and wouldn't let go. And I'm just so grateful that you did. And you see that every year this is improving, improving, improving. Koretz is absolutely correct. We got pushback from general managers. And I think that Mr. Harris Dawson, you were the right person at the right time to be the tip of the spear on this issue, partnered with Mr. Krikorian and, and Mr. Koretz in particular. But this young man that's getting ready to speak uh, has, has just, we are so fortunate, yeah. Matt, to have you uh, because you have that mad scientist brain <laughs> that helps us get these things done. So let's give the mayor and Matt a round of applause. <laughs> give yourselves a round of applause. You guys made this happen, not us. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And, uh, and on that point, um, you know, one of the great things about this program um, is that it has really been a model for how to conduct healthy labor relations in Los Angeles. So often uh, in the media, the relationship between management and labor is viewed in a negative light. It's about conflict over salaries and benefits and whether there's going to be a strike or whether they're giving up too much public money. But in this case, um, and I do have to, as, as you said, Mr. President, give the coalition um, tremendous credit because they came to the table and they said, we have a couple of problems here. We have services that need to be restored. We have people in the community that need jobs. And so we, they came to the table. We worked out an innovative solution to uh, adjust some of the rules. A lot, as, as you said, you know, the city is, it's a giant bureaucracy. There are a lot of rules. This program is based on allowing folks to come in a little bit quicker and easier, and, uh, and it's taken a little bit of time to get going, but um, the personnel department and everyone involved also wanted to do it right and make it part of the fabric of how we hire moving forward. Um, and so we had some some very good success, but the real success is, if, is making this program uh, the bread and butter for where we go to hire as, as, we, uh, as we move forward. So on behalf of the mayor, I do want to just make a few acknowledgments. Um, you know, he, the mayor often says you can't manage what you don't measure. And it is, I have to start with council member Marquise Harris Dawson, who uh, literally uh, drug the departments into LAPD's Comstat room um, and made them go top to bottom with their plan as to how they're going to hire using this program. Um, and that has real lasting effects, and it becomes part of how they think about how they're putting their budget together, which we're going and we're developing right now. Every single department understands that if they want to get pr uh, positions approved in the budget, uh, the best way to do that is to commit to hiring through Target or Local Hire. Um, I want to thank uh, Wendy Macy and Vince Cordero from the Personnel Department. Um, who were very diligent in putting together a program like this together that could work for the long term. And of course, as uh, uh, the council members said, uh, Jackie Goldberg for, for leading the effort, for cracking the whip early and often and hard um, to get folks in line to make, this, to make this work. So we couldn't have done it without Jackie. And still cracking the whip. Still cracking the whip. <laughs> um, and then just in, in, in terms of our departments, I do want to acknowledge the departments that have stepped up the airport leading the way with the most hires, um, the police department, rec and parks, library. Um, we have our general manager of building and safety who has committed to hire 100% of the uh, entry level positions through target or local hire. Uh, we have our general manager from uh, street services here who has already exceeded his goal of 50 hires. Um, so again, I want to just acknowledge that. Thank you, Adele. Um, so again, we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you, um, Council Member Harris Dawson, um, and we look forward to really making this uh, a part of the fabric for how the city hires in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Mayor. Now I want to uh, bring up uh, the person who I think is the, the star of the show. She's been working on this uh, for a long, long time. When I first started as an organizer, one of the first meetings I ever went to was Councilwoman Jackie Goldberg trying to get the city to set up a program for people transferring off of welfare, because we had welfare reform back then, transferring off of welfare onto uh, work. And she's continued uh, to, like folks say, uh, crap, crack the whip. Uh, Mr. Cedillo, when I first got on the council, she was one of the people that interpreted uh, sort of bureaucratic language to me. So I come back and I say, Jackie, well, they said this. She said, that means no, you got to go back. And I said, well, they said this. And she said, that means no, go back. And so uh, we've been very proud to have you as a, a partner. You've been uh, invaluable to this effort. The one and only Honorable Jackie Goldberg. Let's give her a round of applause, everyone. Thank you very much. Mr. President, members of the council, I'm very pleased to be here to honor all of the people who have made this possible. You know, we had eight people from management and eight people from the uh, coalition of labor unions working together since really about August of, of 2015. 
It took a while, but I will tell you, I have never been more proud of a group of people because they were able to come together and figure out all of the little details and problems of not interfering with civil service, but yet making it possible for a new way for people to enter into jobs that lead to the middle class, which is really the difference between working from the city and working at Burger King, right? You can get entry to the middle class, and that's what this has been about. So first I wanna thank Wendy Macy, the chair of uh, the GM of personnel, is she with us? There yeah, she is. I want to tell you that working with this woman has been an enormous pleasure because used to be when I was on the council, I would talk to personnel and they might say, well, I don't think we've ever done that before or we've never tried that this way or we tried it once and it didn't work or whatever. Wendy Mesa said, we can do that. We can do that. We can do that. And that's really an extraordinary thing to have in charge of a major department like personnel. Vince, thank you, Wendy. Vincent Cordero, where's Vincent? Raise your hand. This man has been the heart and soul of this program. He has looked at every detail, he has watched every problem, he has brought forward every issue in a way that let this working group work. And with him are Maria Ku, Esther Chang, uh, Louis Fernandez, and Cynthia Fletes is a new last name for Cynthia Fletes. All right, will they all raise their hands? This is the working group in the personnel department <clears throat> that makes things go. In the coalition uh, of unions, we had, of course, uh, Carmen Hayes Walker, who's here with us today, Teresa Sanchez, Molly Rhodes, and I think there are other folks here from AFSCME and other groups, uh, but uh, they were involved from the beginning. And the managers, we had Jody Yaksimer and Robert Sines, Jaime Pacheco Orozco. I'm sure I'm leaving someone out, but I wanted you to know that in two and a half years of working together, we have never had anything but a unanimous vote on our decisions. Now that tells you something. That tells you that everyone there was looking for solutions. And when people look for solutions, it doesn't matter which side of the aisle they sit on, they find them. And so it has been my pleasure to do this. We are going to be adding warehouse and tool room worker, street services worker, and delivery driver to the jobs that can be filled by targeted local hiring. We're still trying to work on call center and a few other places to do that. But I will tell you that this way of filling entry level positions is one that makes a huge difference to the people. We have now had at least 7,000 applicants uh, and they have come literally from all of the categories of targeted hiring and I'm not gonna mention the number that we've yeah. hired to date because we're I understand it. we're saving that to the end, but it's <laughs> terrific. Our questions that remain, how to insource jobs that should be city work, that's still an issue that we're working on, how to work together to make sure that the folks that are recruited get an opportunity to work for the city of Los Angeles. And I just wanna thank all of you who've made this possible for me to do this because this is work that has been close to my heart for a very long time and I've had an opportunity to work with unbelievably open-minded people who wanted to make something happen for people in this city and I thank all of you for letting me work with you. I, for, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot, absolutely forgot our, our uh, um, folks that are uh, in the uh, work source centers. We have nine work source centers. Would you guys all raise your hands? And nine work source centers who have become unbelievably connected to more than 120 community-based organizations to make this a flow that comes from the community and through those work source centers into the city of Los Angeles. Now I'm done, thank you. <laughs> thank you one more time for the Honorable Jackie Goldberg. Uh, she's keeping it going. We wanna call uh, to the podium now uh, really the center and the heart and soul of this program, the, the people that make it real. Uh, from our U UAW South LA WorkSource Center, uh, we have a representative, and she is going to bring forward uh, one of our new targeted local hire workers. Hi, good morning. My name is Lauren McNeil. I'm the director of UAW Labor, Employment, and Training Corporation, and we operate the South Los Angeles WorkSource Center. Um, I've really seen this program, the TLH program, develop in the last couple of years. And basically, it's been through results. 
um, how we've been able to really outreach to so many individuals is essentially we were one of the first application sites in South Los Angeles. And so basically through the success of the program, it's been pretty much word of mouth. But I'm not going to talk too much because I really want you to um, be introduced to one of our success stories and beneficiaries of the program, Pamela Stokes. Good morning, Mr. President, council members. I am proud to say that I am a success story of the Target Local Hire. Uh, they helped me not only to grow as a person, but also to grow in the career field with the city. I went in through under Ms. McNeil at the WorkSource Center in District, I'm sorry, forgive me, I'm a little bit nervous, in District 8. Don't be nervous, and I you're doing fine. I have to thank Mr. Dawson, I'm so grateful for all of you for this program. I went in uh, with the revising of a resume. I went in, I applied in July of 2017, and by December of 2018, I was working. Uh, and I am so proud, I'm so grateful. I am an employee of LAWA. I work at the security badge office, whom I see numerous of applicants every day, and I do refer them to the local target. <laughs> and again, I am grateful for you, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Yeah, thank you. You're great. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Stokes, and, and thank you uh, to everyone who's here. I want to give a, a really big shout out uh, to, the, to the labor movement that's represented here. Uh, like we said when we were here with April Verrett, there's, it's, it's, you're a really good union if you fight for your members, but you're a great union when you fight for your neighbors. And you all have done that in a very big and material way. And so a big round of applause to the City Coalition of Unions. Uh, and now for the, the, the big announcement, we get a little drum roll, Mr. President. The targeted local hire program in the City of Los Angeles in our most uh, underserved communities has hired 500 workers oh, right. yeah, in the last right. two years. And if we keep going like we're going, we'll be able to hire 1,000 workers and meet the demand that was put forward by the City uh, Coalition of Unions uh, that we bring on over 1,000 new workers uh, to do the services that each and every one of our neighborhoods need. And so uh, with that, uh, Mr. President, I have a few presentations here. Go right ahead. Uh, the first one is for our targeted local hire working group. So I know there are working group members here. Somebody can grab that one. All right, Ms. Sanchez. <laughs> Ms. Sanchez was in that meeting with, about welfare reform. Yes, she was. <laughs> she, she was, you remember? Was. Yeah, and then we have another one for, for our leader, Ms. Jackie Goldberg. All right, Jackie. And then we have another one for the WorkSource Center, the UAW Workforce Center. Wonderful. There you go. Thank you all so much, Mr. President. Now, thank you. Let's give them one more big round of applause. <laughs> Madam Clerk, it's my understanding we can take Come up on, item we'll 12, close. I think, at this time. So on item 12, let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, do you want to de dispense with 26? Yes, th thank you, Mr. President. Um, colleagues, uh, item 26 is, uh, a, is uh, a directive to the city attorney for us to draft, to have an ordinance draft as it relates to the enforcement and shutdown of illegal cannabis operations. I know many of us, when we're always struggling with identifying how are we going to deal with the enforcement of uh, these dispensaries that have really prolifer proliferated a number of our communities, we have to find common sense solutions that don't have greater impacts in our ability to actually shut them down effectively and ensure compliance given all of the work that we have done to make sure that we are doing everything that we can to protect our communities. I want to thank the Department of Cannabis Regulation, the Department of Water and Power, LAPD. We have been working very closely, uh, my office and I have been working very closely with them to accelerate this process so that we have a permanent solution that will help shut down the Water and Power Service at these illegal 
operators so that we can assure that we are creating a safer environment for our communities and that we are forcing compliance amongst many of the individuals that have chosen an alternative path to making sure that they are following the rules and regulations that we have put forward as it relates to providing legalized cannabis operations in the city of Los Angeles, and I ask for your aye vote. Thank you. Now let me call on Ms. Martinez. President and colleagues, um, thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Um, colleagues, from the day I got here, I've been incredibly vocal on in terms of what we needed to do to shut down illegal cannabis operations in my district in particular. Five years ago, the community of Arlita, for example, had over 20 cannabis operations operating illegally in my district, and so on and so forth. I think my frustration with the lack of enforcement and the rapid illicit operations that sprung up all over my district was a concern, but the voters of California and the voters of Los Angeles um, made their choice by voting and making cannabis legal in California. So we acted as a council to ensure that we provided rules and regulations to go along with cannabis operations. Um, you know, shutting down the utilities for a, an operation that's illegally operating is just, it's a, it's a, it's a no-brainer. I mean, it's just that simple. When you are operating illegally in a community, you're creating havoc, and you're not playing by the rules, you should get shut down. And I think it's something that Mr. Buscaino, back in 2016, sir, you introduced a, res a motion to go ahead and move in this direction as well. So the motion that you, that's before us uh, to Council, uh, Councilwoman Rodriguez and I have introduced goes one step further to ensure that this finally happens. Um, I also want to thank you, Mr. Weston. I know when we pushed back in 2017 uh, to go ahead and provide uh, a proposal of rules and regulations to folks who want to play by the rules, we also made sure that we requested all the different departments in our city to move in this direction, that when you're operating illegally, you should not be able to uh, turn on your electricity and you shouldn't be able to turn on your faucet because you're simply not paying by the rules. I've always been very, very clear about this issue. The over-concentration of cannabis should not only exist in my districts and districts of color. There you should be equity across the board if you want to be able to purchase cannabis legally, you should be able to do it in every square inch of the city and it should be legal and you should be able to play by the rules. I want to uh, thank uh, our departments and DCRC for your tremendous effort on this issue. I know it's been difficult. I know you need more resources. I know in this budget we're talking about this, about making sure you have all the resources to be able to shut down the bad operators and be able to move our process along. So I want to thank LAPD as well and DWP. And I also ask for your I vote and thank you very much, Ms. Rodriguez, for continuing to partner and making sure that our communities are not left behind, but that equity is actually equitable across the city. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, I just want to thank Ms. Rodriguez and all of the signers of this motion for your leadership on this. And just to underscore why this is so important to develop all of the tools we can for enforcement, um, I have an emerging commercial area in my district. Uh, and it is an area that once uh, was pockmarked with empty storefronts and underperforming commercial spaces, which is now thriving. But right in the middle of this thriving, emerging commercial district is an illegal, non-permitted pot shop. And over the holidays, there was a shootout because there's a criminal element attached to this illegal location. By the grace of God, no one was injured, uh, and no casualties, very little damage. Nonetheless, anytime there are shots fired because there's an illegal element operating illegally in a non-permitted commercial area, that more and more people are flocking to, you can imagine the kind of dangers that this location, because of the operators of this site, are putting everyone else in. So these types of uh, ordinances are more important than ever as we continue striving to make our neighborhoods safer and more vibrant. It's really time to shut down all of these illegal pot shops because you never really know what element is operating behind those doors. So this can't happen soon enough, and I thank you for your leadership, Ms. Rodriguez. Okay, Mr. Buscaino. You're right, Mr. O'Farrell, this cannot happen soon enough, so let's see how long it takes the city attorney 
to come back to get this ordinance in our hands. Um, some of the frustrations we have around here. Nonetheless, Ms. Rodriguez, um, uh, thank you for your leadership on this. Uh, Nuri and I worked on uh, finding ways to shut down the illegal operators uh, pr even prior to Measure D in our respective districts. So I'm happy to see you carrying on the torch um, to effect effectuate this change. You know, at the same time, we're, we're hearing from those legal operators today that have been very frustrated um, f with this creating this unfair competition market, thus losing the tax revenue that we were banking on. So it's good for us to go to the source, shut them down, go straight to the power, put, hit their water, shut down their water, ultimately with the hopes of, of shutting down this uh, illegal operations. And we owe it to the voters as well who um, approved um, Measure D moving forward and the people of the state and people of the city. So um, let's demand that we get this ordinance back in a timely manner so we can use this as an effective tool, as I've seen um, as, as my years as a police officer, even more so dealing with the issue of illegal operators um, on illegal cannabis sales. So hoping that we can get this soon and, and move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boos. Mr. Blumenthal. To echo my colleagues, it's really important to, to deal with the illegal shops so that we can get a more orderly way to go. Even on, sometimes when we turn off the power, I have one, a couple of them, we turn off the power and the next day you see a generator on top of the roof. Uh, it's so profitable, folks are figuring out ways to circumvent the law. So, so this and all other steps that we can take to crack down on the illegal ones, to create a, a regular business environment uh, is critically important. So thank you for bringing this forward. All right, members, let's prepare to vote on this item. Please open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Okay, that's approved. So I'm going to switch back to public comment for a few more, uh, uh, call up a few more individuals. Mary Beth, Carolyn Chris, is it Danae Clark, Philip Ganshev? Please identify yourself and welcome. Hi, my name is Mary Beth Trotwine. I'm a resident of Venice, and um, I've been uh, attending meetings about the environment over the past year and pretty much over my time of living in California. Um, I last June was in the meeting, the Stand LA Coalition, with you, Herb Wesson and Marquise Dawson. So I want to say thank you for making the goals towards 100% renewable energy. All of LA citizens are impacted by dirty fossil fuel. We need to go towards 2030 for our goal for clean renewable energy. Thank you. So Mary Beth, you were at home in church that meeting? I sure was, just okay. a few feet away from you. <laughs> All right, good to see you again. Thank you. Please come forward, identify yourself. Hi, good morning. My name is Carolyn Chris. I am an indivisible leader from Sherman Oaks. I'm also a newly elected uh, delegate to the California Democratic Party. And I, when I moved to California, it was in the 60s, and Los Angeles had the dirtiest air in the country. And we initiated new gas emission regulations for the automobile industry. And I remember all of those smog days where you were not allowed to go outside. And now, during my time here, I have seen those disappear. But at the time, the pushback was, this is the end of the world as we now know it. And it's going to destroy California's economy. I want to remind people that making these big changes always has pushback Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Identify yourself. Hello. Hello. My name is Dana Ezekiel Clark, and I live in Venice. I was also in the uh, meeting, the uh, oh, meeting that we spoke about. And I wanted to just say, um, in LA Story, there's a there's a part where Steve Martin says to his lover when she's about to leave him. I know there's something I can say that will make you stay. I don't know what it is, but why don't we pretend that I just said it? <laughs> so I know there's something I can say so that you guys will all come together and push for clean renewable energy by 2030 because 
2045 is just way too long. We really should do it sooner than 2030. And I want to say I'm working with Indivisible now on California legislation. And one of my strongest feelings is that as goes California, so goes the rest of the nation. How about as goes Los Angeles, so goes the rest of the nation? How about that? I like that. Thank you. All right. Uh, and I'm assuming this is Philip, so I'm going to call Mark Lipman and Gabriel Nunez. Nunez. Mark, I mean, uh, Philip, the floor is yours. Hi, Philip Ganchev. I live in West LA. I work with Food and Water Watch and uh, Protect Playa Now Coalition. I want to thank the council for uh, moving for 100% renewable energy or um, shutting down the, the gas plants along the LA coast. Uh, sorry, for, for not re, re, repowering the gas plants. Um, the next step is um, moving forward to, to shut them down and shut down all the fossil fuel infrastructure that we have in the city. Um, and we have to do that by 2030. Um, a, a study commissioned by Food and Water Watch and uh, completed by Synapse Energy Economics found that uh, we can do that by 2030 cheaper than most people think. Um, it's going to involve battery storage, um, uh, wind and solar energy, um, and LA is in a great position uh, to achieve that. Um, other utilities around the country uh, have also have ambitious goals. So. Thank you. Next. Greetings, council members. Uh, my name is Gabriel Nunez, and I'm a customer of the uh, LAW, LADWP. I live in Wilmington by the harbor and have worked throughout Los Angeles County and the state of California as an environmental field technician. Uh, the quality of our air, water, and other natural resources is of great concern to me personally, and I'm here today to express support for the advancement of clean energy options like solar, wind, geothermal, and hydropower, with the goal of reaching 100% renewable energy by the year 2030. This transition can and should include incredible new employment opportunities for the citizens of Los Angeles at fair, living wages, uplifting our local economy and the quality of life for all Angelinos. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to call up a few more people in a minute. I've got some other city business to do. I want to call up Mr. Buscaino, I believe item 18, I think. Item 18. If we can, uh, we can have ITQ the photo. So colleagues, this item before you is a very um, important issue for me as a father of two. This photo before you reminds me of the many times when as a father I had to get creative when taking care of my children. Here in Los Angeles we pride ourselves on building a city of equity, um, but too often our infrastructure doesn't express that. As fathers continue to be more involved with child care than ever before, spending triple the amount of time caring for their kids than they were in 1965, our infrastructure has to keep up. Um, in this scenario of changing a diaper, the, the lack of equal infrastructure leads to one of two common outcomes. Either fathers have to get creative, like this man before you, or pass on child care responsibilities to their female partners who have access to diaper changing stations in their restrooms. So our parks are a great resource for our city's families. Uh, they are a place for fun, relaxation, exercise, family bonding time, and so much more. But if a father is out at one of our city recreation and parks facilities without a female companion, he has to do this, which puts his child in unsanitary and dangerous conditions. And this is why I authored the motion before you. I'm number 18 before um, the city council requesting the Department of Recreation and Parks to report back on how many diaper changing stations we need to install in men's restrooms um, in city facilities. And um, this motion before you complements a separate motion already in the works uh, that would provide changing stations in all men's restrooms in city facilities. With my motion today, we'll address all city facilities, so I ask for your eye vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buscaino. Uh, Mr. Clerk, let's prepare to vote on this item. Please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. The 13 vote. ninths. The vote, not the vote, but the vote. All right. Mr. Buscaino, if I could trouble you for yep. a moment. Let's uh, take up Mr. Weezar's item, which I believe is item 31. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, this item here is a motion that will approve uh, some funding for a, an emergency shelter 
a lease and sublease uh, that will, can and allow us to house 115 individuals in an emergency shelter in as, in as little as three months. As you all know, uh, we're facing a homelessness crisis here in the city of LA and Skid Row is the epicenter of this crisis. But, <coughs> excuse me, but, but around Skid Row, our homeless population continues to increase. Uh, just uh, south of Skid Row, in fewer than 100 blocks, south of 7th Street to just past Washington Boulevard, Boulevard between Maple and Alameda Streets, there are some 600 people living unsheltered on the streets. Oftentimes, this happens because, as many of you know, either homeless individuals get dumped in downtown Skid Row, they come for services in Skid Row, but be, given the uh, overwhelming capacity at which our, our services are at in Skid Row, they wander the streets of downtown LA into areas like 7th and Washington Boulevard around Maple and Alameda. And in the homelessness count for 2018, there were an additional 100 unsheltered individuals in the area. And in neighborhoods throughout the city of LA, we can tell about similar stories. This the, uh, emergency response is unique. It's unique in that as many of us have been looking around our districts for parking lots, for public uh, spaces that we could house individuals, this is one of the first for the city to use private property to move forward and provide emergency shelter. Uh, even today, we saw Mr. Buscaino's resolution that calls for greater access to Caltrans properties. Mr. Bonin is looking at parking lot at Venice Beach that was approved today as well. And we've got to get, continue to get more creative as we are here. This site uh, wouldn't be possible without the property owner coming to us and the county saying that he has available a warehouse willing to lease to the city and the county to house homeless individuals around this area. Michael Kaboud stepped up and offered his building at the Paloma site. Uh, and now uh, we uh, are working with the mayor's office, uh, the, a, br the uh, bridge home program, uh, to bring in additional services that these individuals need. Now, as we all know, whenever we try to site these emergency housing uh, throughout the city, we are met with uh, some nimbyism. We are met with uh, some misinformation about what these sites are about. Uh, we faced the same thing here. We had several property owners around the area that didn't want to see a site uh, near their buildings that they said would attract additional homeless to the area. But working with the A Bridge Home Program, we assured them that we, we, we will bring additional resources around the area to help with the situation. That means that Alley Sanitation will deploy in the area five days a week, reaching under the 10 freeway and as far south as Washington Boulevard additional services. Uh, there will be an additional 24-7 LAPD attention. Uh, there were, uh, LASA, LASA outreach will be intensified and we will have additional support services around the area's businesses and the three schools in the area to assist with this. Those pieces that we put out for them that will assist in uh, giving more services to the individuals around the site is what I think led a number of those businesses to agree that they would support the site uh, and that was very critical for this. Uh, I wanna thank numerous people who helped put this together, particularly uh, my staff, Martin and Edna and our downtown LA, DTLA team. I wanna thank this council for your additional resources that went into last year's budget with Mr. Kikorian's support to have more of these sites throughout the city. Uh, some of that money is making this site possible, so that's our money being put to work. I wanna thank the mayor and the county and county supervisor, Mark Willie Thomas, for the partnership they have offered in supporting this site to operate under the Bridge Home Program. And again, I'd like to thank the property owner, Michael Kaboud, for standing up and making this possible. And also, uh, Councilmember O'Farrell, who was working on his site uh, in Hollywood, who uh, this team here said they learned a lot from in making, uh, making this possible as well. Uh, local, locally, we had the support from CCA, LA Chamber, and the Coalition for Responsible Community Development, and Homeboy Electronics, as well as a number of neighboring business owners. Uh, so all around, I think this is a good thing for the area, but obviously, we have to continue to find sites throughout the city and not continue to uh, site them and concentrate them in downtown. People go there because they think they're gonna receive services, but our overwhelmed service agencies cannot often, uh, cannot provide services at some times and they are uh, forced to wander the streets in other areas of downtown. This is gonna go a long way, but until we build permanent supportive housing, uh, it, the, it's incumbent upon us to build more emergency shelters throughout the city. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for an I vote. Thank you, Mr. Weizar. Supporting solutions. So with that, colleagues, let's open the row, roll on this item. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 
14 ayes. That is approved. With that, let's now turn to uh, general public comment. Herman, come on up. Followed by Mark Lippman. Yep, yep, yep. We got a new look here at City Hall. And it starts with my councilman who spoke so gracefully about the homeless situation that he created through the gentrification and stealing of federal dollars for development and padding his wallet with what? Salesian High School Catholic Church lobbying money through the church. We need to put an end to the Catholic Church for fucking young kids and prevent Fat Mommy Nuri for coming up with lies about cannabis. Fucking bitch, you ask for Measure 64, that's what you get. You can't regulate and protect some bullshit on cannabis because cunts like you don't know what the fuck you're doing and that's the reason why this country is going to hell. Donald Trump, on your behalf, on 42 USC 1983, fuck the city attorney. Okay, Mark Lipman, you're up. And Mr. President, Ms. Mr. Herman, just going forward, you're perfectly free to film us, but please don't have a light flashing at us like that next time. Mark Lippman. Jane Fowler. Natalie Rothstein. Rothstein. Your name, please. Hi, I'm Jane Fowler. Welcome, thank you. I live in Granada Hills, which is um, right near the Aliso Canyon, you know, that blowout that happened. So I am so excited about this. Uh, Mary Garcetti um, saying that there will be uh, no new gas plants and vowing to go 100% renewable. Um, our community is excited about this. And I just have to say that right now in Aliso Canyon, we have another pipe broken above ground. And uh, we do not need any more broken pipes um, regarding our gas storage. So um, thank you for going uh, clean energy and please make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Natalie Rothstein, um, Jasmine Vargas, Claudia Perea, James Merez. Morning. Hi, uh, my name is James Merez. I'm a Venice resident, and I'm here to speak on uh, uh, the concept that uh, a community impact statement from our neighborhood council was not able to be read into the record today. It was filed this morning. We got very late notice of a committee meeting uh, that was held last week. Um, we were not notified, and under uh, the city charter, we're supposed to be notified with ample time to be able to respond. We were not given that time. You were in that commission meeting last week, along with uh, Councilman Bonin um, and Mr. Koretz, but we didn't have the opportunity to, to get it together. We had to have a special meeting actually last night just to be able to get the community impact statement into you today. And then I was told that it's the decision of your body to not allow the Brown Act to take place. This body is making the decision on the committee. The committee can't make the law. This body did. And this body making that decision is violating the Brown Act by not giving public the opportunity to make comment. Thank you. I'll afford the out, Mr. Bond, to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, in light of that comment, I'd actually like us to uh, reconsider item 13 on today's agenda uh, in order to uh, make an opportunity available to include the community impact statement into the record. Okay, let's uh, take a vote on reconsideration of item number 13. Let us uh, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. Okay, now let's now um, take on item 13 now. Okay, uh, Mr. Mears, is there a, a written thing you want to put into the record, or um, you are, uh, as a neighborhood council member, you have uh, five minutes, the I opportunity believe. to yes. make a statement to, sp to speak on behalf of the neighborhood council since a community impact statement 
Uh, so I'm not going to, James Mirez for the record, I'm not going to take five minutes. I don't think it takes that much time. We're not in uh, opposition to the motion that was made. We just want to make sure that several previous decisions and actions that were taken by this council, um, including a 2012 uh, uh, transportation report for West LA that included a document that was called in-loop parking fees um, is considered as part of the study. Um, there was also a parking and transportation plan in the late 1980s that was uh, very instrumental um, to what the future requirements for Venice was in the way of parking. Um, those documents and others that have more recently been passed by our neighborhood council should all be considered. Um, none of those were mentioned in the uh, decision for the uh, city to undertake this report to now uh, try and create a housing project where the city only owns one large parking lot in Venice large enough to actually offset the uh, negative um, parking uh, capacity that, that Venice has. And this has gone on for more than 30 years. It's been documented with the Coastal Commission. It's in our land use plan. We have no other opportunities to fix our parking. The city only has one primary lot in Venice large enough to, to build a parking structure. And, and, and on a particular note that I think everybody can understand, um, if we had parking, our substandard size commercial lots, which are approximately 2,700 square feet, uh, they cannot at this point be developed commercially. They can't be used commercially. Building and safety has recently gone down Abbott Kenny, if you're familiar with the street, and shut down four businesses because they were being operated as commercial businesses for the last 40 years, and all of a sudden they realized that they actually only had residential permits. But they can't be used commercially because they can't comply to parking. And on a lot that's only 2,700 square feet, to also put parking means it's impossible to do it. And between the city's laws for what parking requirements are and the Coastal Commission laws, we're stuck in a quandary where we can't develop our community. All the communities around us have solved this problem. City of Santa Monica has a parking district. Individual properties are no longer required to produce commercial parking. Well, in Venice, we still have to. And we're under a land use plan review right now. We're going through a new process. Um, this needs to be fixed. And if we give away the only site we have to solve the problem, the problem's gonna never go away. And the financial economics of this to the city is huge because that means that the redevelopment causes the tax value of the property to go way up, but also the business income. The business taxes are huge and we don't have anywhere near what our build out capability is because we can't park. And so on that, uh, you got the community impact statement, both a short form and a long form. I appreciate your time, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bonin. President, uh, colleagues, I'll ask for approval of this item. Uh, thank the Neighborhood Council for the community impact statement and note that as this is the beginning of a study by LADOT to determine how to uh, incorporate or maximize the amount of public parking in the uh, on the property where the permanent supportive housing will be located that the those considerations can be taken into account by DOT in the study and the report back which is due back before October ask for an I vote thank you thank you mr. Bonner so with that let's now uh, open the roll close the roll tabulate the vote 14 eyes that is approved okay now let's um, a few more general public comment I'd like to uh, welcome Alexandra Nagy. Please come forward. Followed by Matt Shorty. Good morning, Council. My name is Alexandra Nagy, and I'm the senior organizer with Food and Water Watch. And this morning we had a press conference and rally outside to thank the Council and the Mayor for its leadership to stop rebuilding the gas plants and look to 100% renewable energy. Um, last year, we commissioned a report by Synapse Energy Economics showing how we can get to 100% renewable energy by 2030. And this means that we need to deploy more energy efficiency, increase our storage locally, increase our local solar, and do better management of the grid. Um, and we really wanna work with the utility to ensure this rapid and equitable transition to 100% renewable energy. And I really wanted to thank the council members in this room who have been leading on this work, Councilmember Gregorian, Councilmember Martinez, 
Um, Councilmember Bonin, thank you so much. Councilmember Koretz, all of you have been working so hard on this and we look forward to working with you further. And we have a lot of ideas to put these plans in place and make sure we're really transitioning as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Max Shorty. I just stopped by to uh, offer some encouragement to our council staff and uh, members. You guys really have to wear a really thick trench coat. And I command you guys, you guys are, you know, people to look up to and admire. I mean, I was just at a black history program, 400 years of Uhuru uprising. And just hearing some of the comments here today reminds me of why we as black people prayed and kept God among us to get over in a country that really wasn't so welcoming. And I just want to encourage you guys to keep up the fight. We won't ever be able to please everyone, but you guys are doing a great job despite the circumstances, and thank you. Thank you, Matt, it's good to see you. Keep in mind that's only that one person that uh, we're struggling with around here. So with that, uh, I see, a, is it a ween? Nope, that must have been one of the gadflies, okay. So with that, we just uh, end public comment. So what's before us? Council has motions for posting and referral. They are posted and referred. The desk is clear. Any announcements, colleagues? Announcements? Okay, seeing none, adjourning motions. Please rise for adjourning motions. I'll start with Mr. Awizar. President and colleagues, I ask that we adjourn today in memory of Refugio Lopez. Refugio Perez Lopez was born in Jalisco, Mexico on July 11, 1939. He married Soledad Lopez on May 25, 1966, and together they had seven children and 12 grandchildren. Refugio was a man of family, faith, and deep, genuine love for others, including his community. He and his wife moved to Los Angeles in the late 1960s and settled in Bull Heights on Pecan Street where they raised their children. Refugio, along with his wife, Soledad, became active members of the Boyle Heights community. Refugio led several transformational community efforts that continue to positively impact the community. Some of his efforts include installing speed bumps on Pecan Street, establishing the Green Gate Alley Program, replacing dirt roads with red brick along Pecan Street that hadn't been serviced by the city in decades. He also personally commissioned a, re an, a reformed gangster to paint a mural of the Virgen de Guadalupe on La Callecita, a cul-de-sac adjacent to their home to prevent further graffiti. Along with his friend Nacho, Refugio constructed benches so people could stop by to pray or sleep. Refugio's advocacy for his neighborhood did not wane with age. He and his good friend Nacho continued to visit my Bowl Heights office to further advocate on various improvements in the community. Like many Angelinos, Refugio was an avid Dodgers fan. However, he refused to go to Dodger games because he said, who in their right mind would pay $15 for a beer and pay for little dots on the diamond when you could watch every game from the comfort of his home? In fact, at his uh, memorial, his son gave the story of how he would start each game at the kitchen making some tacos for himself. Then midway through the game, he'd sit on the sofa, and by the end of the game, he was sitting on his bed watching the end of the game. Rafugio enjoyed good food and loved the pastrami from First and Hicks, Walden burnt carne asada, birria from Chalillo's restaurant, and Heradura tequila. His proudest accomplishments was the Catholic, Catholic education his children received at Dolores Mission, St. Mary's, Salesian, and Sacred Heart, and watching his children graduate from UC Berkeley, Cal State LA, the University of San Francisco, and USC. For nearly 40 years, Refugio worked tirelessly in construction, but did so happily to provide for his family. He retired on Christmas Eve, 1997. Refugio was a man of strong faith and never faltered. He and his wife, Soledad, attended mass every Sunday at St. Mary's or Dolores Mission, sitting next to one another holding hands, praying for each other and their children. And he journeyed, as he journeyed to the sunset of his life and experienced difficulty walking, Soledad would attend Sunday service without him, and upon return, she would read the Sunday scripture and give Refugio communion. On a personal level uh, that I got to know uh, Refugio, he was a loving husband, father, grandfather, and friend. I will certainly miss seeing his, uh, his very um, pleasant presence and telling him, hola Cuco, como esta todo? 
and then he would go on and rattle off everything about what's wrong in the community, but what everybody's doing to correct what's wrong in the community. My deepest condolences to his wife Soledad, his children Herminia, Olga, Refugio, Arnold, Maricela, and Adrian, his 12 grandchildren, and countless friends, family, and community members whose lives he touched. May he rest in peace. Refugio Lopez, presente. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wezar. Mr. Cedillo. Members, this is a um, story of Felipe Plasencia. Felipe Plasencia's story is the true American story. He was born December 13, 1965, in Tepetitlan, Jalisco, Mexico. In 1972, he, along with his parents, his siblings, left Mexico and came north to Santana, Santana, Orange County. There, in the mid-80s, they met the legendary organizer and immigrant leader, Bert Corona, and Nativo Lopez, and began to be affiliated with their organization, Edmundad Mexicana. As immigrants, they were pro-immigration uh, reform, and in the mid-80s, they took advantage of, of IRCA and became citizens. During that time period, he was in high school. He was an athlete who distinguished himself in soccer, cross-country, and track while working several jobs to help his family. Later, he went on to Loyola Law School. He wasn't initially admitted, but he waited in the office of the president of the school, sat there patiently the entire day until he got an opportunity to speak to the president. There, upon his presentation, the president, so impressed, admitted him personally to the school. He continued to go to school, he continued to work and to support his family. From there, he entered into public service, first as a public defender for the county of Los Angeles, and then later as a city attorney for the city of Compton. From that point on, he decided that he would go into the private sector, and he became probably the most successful and effective trial lawyer in the state of California. Clearly in his field, he was the preeminent defense attorney for those who have issues with uh, DUIs. He was trained by Jerry Spence. He was one of the top trial lawyers in the nation. And he was just extraordinary as a lawyer. But he was also uh, a political leader. Uh, while in uh, undergrad at uh, Cal State Fullerton, he met his two loves of life. One was his wife, Yolanda. And the second was his advocacy on behalf of poor people and people who have been disadvantaged. And he became their fiercest uh, advocate and their most competent advocate. He was clearly one of the most extraordinary trial lawyers that this state and this country knows. Uh, his training, his preparation for juries, his understanding of science, uh, him bringing together psychology, uh, bringing all the elements of life into each jury and into each trial he became. Uh, one of the best. I got to meet him in uh, the early 90s when, as a young law student, he was working for Art Goldberg. And Art Goldberg uh, was representing uh, our union, Service Employees International Union, uh, working with the National Lawyers Guild. Their job was to keep me and my members out of jail. Uh, we had a long strike called Rolling Thunder, and then subsequent to that, we had a series of other big um, demonstrations to defend jobs and services, and their job was to keep my members and myself out of jail. We were engaged in civil disobedience, and they were there to make sure that we were either kept out of jail or if we were arrested, that that process was facilitated as well as it could be. I didn't see him for a while. Um, life happens as it does, but shortly after my wife passed, he came up to me and said, hey, you know, remember me? I was the law student that was doing this, and I, we became fast friends. And I have to tell you, uh, on a personal level, he was, uh, as he liked to say, and I'm, I'm flattered to say, my best friend. He was intense in life. He lived every single second of life to its fullest. You think of that, and you think, well, you just think that this man is going to live forever. And he had an intensity about life, a zeal, 
uh, a zealousness, a love, a commitment, and a discipline to do everything he did to its fullest. Whether it was his diet, whether it was his exercise routine, whether it was his trial prep, whether it was going out with his friends for dinner, whether it was having sushi over at Sushi Jen on 2nd and San Pedro, whatever he did, he did to its fullest. And if you were his friend, you had to push back on his incredible generosity. Uh, if you were with him and you were out, you could never pay for a meal or uh, anything. I mean, he just, I mean, he took you everywhere. Uh, there's a, a great uh, Armenian restaurant that he likes that he would take us to. And he made sure he knew everybody and he made sure that everything was taken care of whenever you went there, these big feasts that we would have. Uh, he was a, a member of MABA, the Mexican American Bar Association, and the president of the MABA PAC. And he used uh, and worked with that MABA PAC to, to be an advocate for people. And he was indifferent to your politics uh, and to who you were. It was a, the MABA PAC is diverse. Uh, and he's just looking for people who will fight and advocate for those who are disadvantaged, independent of where they come from, who they are, who they love, um, where they started in life, uh, where they're going to finish. He was just the consummate advocate, and that was the love of his life. But it was second, and everything was second to the love of his family. Uh, his love for Yolanda, his two daughters that he dotes over, uh, his father, uh, his brothers and sister, his sister Erica, who he's so proud of. Uh, just an incredible, incredible uh, American, uh, a proud Chicano, uh, a Mexican. Uh, this man was just uh, a friend to all. Uh, tragically, um, last Thursday he was working in San Luis Obispo. Uh, he wanted to come back home. No doubt he was staying on schedule. Uh, he had things to do, and so they took a plane back from San Luis Obispo. Uh, that plane encountered the uh, uh, horrible weather over the Tehachapis and went down. It took several days to find both the plane and the bodies. Uh, they were recovered on Sunday afternoon, uh, and um, there were no survivors, obviously. Uh, he will leave a large mark. He spent much of his time, as I said, as an advocate. He had this uh, annual reception. I don't know if Mr. President's not here, but he had this annual reception that everybody would want to be at. So whoever you were, a local elected official or a presidential candidate, uh, they all made their way to this annual uh, mixer that he had in the fall. It was called the VIP mixer. And it was packed with judges and attorneys and district attorneys and public defenders, uh, Kamala Harris, Jerry Brown, Luis Gutierrez, the congressman from Chicago, uh, on and on and on. Everybody wanted to be there because it was the place to be. And he was never happier than he was when he was being generous uh, with, uh, with his friends and his family. Uh, I will miss him every single day. Uh, he was my best friend, and I'm honored to say that. May he rest in peace. Sorry for your loss, Mr. Cedillo. Thoughts and prayers go to you and his entire family. Any other adjourning motions, colleagues? Ms. Gaino, I, yes. I'd like Ms. to Martins. add to the adjourning motion of uh, our friend Felipe Plasencia. If I may, Mr. Cedillo, add me to the motion. Um, I'm still in shock. Um, I don't even know how to process. Um, what happened in the news that we received over the weekend. I know I reached out to Gil and we talked about what made Felipe so special and why he loved us so much. Um, and I met him, I'd only known him for about five or six years, but I met him on my campaign trail. On a Saturday morning, um, I went to go interview before the MABA pack. And I had really no shot at getting that endorsement. I didn't know anybody on the board. Um, I barely even figured out how to get there to begin with. And once I did, I remember Felipe walking me out to my car and looking at me and saying, I don't know who you are, but wow, we need to figure out how to support you. 
And then one thing about Felipe, and I was telling Mitch right now, because you also got endorsed by, yes. by the same pack. One of the few he one loved. Of the few organizations that endorsed me the first time. Correct. And one of the things that we were just talking about is Felipe loves supporting the underdog, mm -hmm. loves supporting a real, the real deal, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the, 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 the struggle of how we were all running against the odds. And that was who he was. Uh, we stayed connected. I just talked to him a couple of weeks ago on something unrelated, but um, I feel for you, Gil. I think very few times we come across people who are just special and who truly love you for the work that you're doing and don't ask for anything in return. And that was, that was Felipe. My heart breaks for Yolanda and his kids and his brothers and sisters were amazing, his father. Talk about an American story and an American hero for our community. It's a huge loss, not only for the legal community, but for the Latino community, and overall, just a special guy. Um, beautiful adjournment, and rest in power, my friend. He was loved, and he's gonna be missed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Any other adjourning motions? Okay, seeing none, we're now adjourned. Go forth and serve the people of the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. <laughs>